The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Darkness recognizes who has the touch of the Holy Ghost within them. Darkness recognizes this. Because so what they normally do is assign individuals to you. They'll be with you. They will hear you, befriend you. They'll do whatever they can do, but they get right beside you. That's because they recognize something within you. Even the person, which is a vessel, it supersedes their knowledge. They don't know why. They don't like you. They don't know why. They do the sneaky things they do. They don't know why, but they end up doing it. It's almost like these people who do these things, they live a duality. They have no idea of the driving force within them. They may try to interpret it, but I'm telling you now, they are near you. They're near you. And so when you do something, they've already plotted how to get you into bondage. In some cases, they'll get very close to you. Listen to me carefully. You ever had somebody ever get close to you? Couples wise, they got close to you, but something in you said, do not pursue this. Anybody ever have that? You don't have to answer that openly. By the Holy Spirit, that answer is already established. Something warned you. Something told you the identity of those individuals. What about friends? You can have a thousand friends. There's always one or two that the Holy Spirit will say, uh-uh, but those seem to be the ones you're drawn to. You know how a lot of people say, I don't know why I'm drawn to such people. Satan works very efficiently in gathering up his people and he will distribute them. The right ones to fit, listen to me, they never fit the spiritual need of a person, but they do fit the physical need of a person. Physical means by way of your mind. So they may be intellectually just what you need, conversationally just what you need. They may, may be that friend that understands your specific condition or position. They have an insight into you. They always supersede those friends that are around you. And that all the whole while, the Holy Spirit's warning you. And what normally happens is a person gives in to their physical attributes. They give in to their own mind, their own logic, and they disregard the spiritual warning. And we all know this. That's where it begins. And you had no idea who these people were because, in fact, looking in hindsight, those were the ones the bondage came through. If they have to marry you, They'll do it to keep you in bondage. Hope you hear me on this. They will keep you in bondage. They will tie you up a thousand different ways and keep you in bondage so that you can never come forward with the Holy Spirit. Some of you, by way of your reputation, they have cut off trust from other people. Now they have you all to themselves. They have changed the way people look at you. Don't ever think you're stuck because you're not. And I'm telling you now, darkness does not like this conversation. See, you think you're stuck. You think you're ruined. You think because of this or because of that. No one's going to trust the word of God coming from your mouth. Don't believe that. You are not stuck. Let me continue. So, without violence, the captain, right, bought them down without violence. Why? Because they feared the people. Isn't it funny? The very thing, that is, that these officers who were dragging around the apostles were afraid of is the very thing that the people in your situation, they keep you away from other people. Have you noticed that? They'll do anything to keep you away from certain people. They don't want you in contact with certain people. They don't want you around certain people. Now, if, and, and, you know, if a person really trusts somebody else in a relationship, what does other people have to do with anything? If you have a good friend or, or whatever the case is, why block you from getting to other people? Because by way of darkness, you're poison to darkness. And they know that if you get in contact with other people, if you go out there with other people, those people become your defense. Did you know that? They will become your defense. That's why you're isolated. That's why people are not your defense, because you're isolated. Let's continue. And when they had bought them, they sat them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now let's pause. If darkness is truly among you, if it's truly among you, and you were to speak to a lot of people about Christ, and the gift within you was truly shared with other folks, those people would seek you out. When those people seek you out, those people have discernment. They also have a light within them. They get around you, then that dark spirit that's around you is flooded with light. And they know, darkness knows where this light comes from. So all 
so often. You may not know this, but that calling the Lord put within you is also your defense. Because when those people come around with light in them, and they too believe in Christ, darkness cannot stand. So darkness has to be sure to put a halt to it, to never let that happen. That's why they keep you in bondage, so that the light in you does not spread and enhance the light around them. Listen to me, this is, this is a funny thing. They will always bring their type around like it's no big deal. Hear me on this. They bring their type around. They're not necessarily rotten folks, but they bring their type around. And then you wonder why you can't have the people, your, your own family members sometimes, to come around you. You, you don't understand what, what the problem is. And you're trying to solve this by way of flesh, but understanding some sort of spiritual crisis happening. What did the apostles do? When the angel broke them out of jail, what did they do? They were commanded to go do something. And what did they do? They were obedient. They did just what the Lord asked them to do. There are so many cases in our lives that you've been given an opportunity. You've been given an opportunity from time to time to go and do something for the Lord. People didn't give you this instruction. That came from the Father. Now listen to me. When that instruction came to you, you had a conversation. And you know what you said? I can't because. You got to look in hindsight for this one. You need not answer anything out loud in the chat room, but search your life. You have to look behind you for this one. You have to remember the circumstances. You have to remember the moment when you said to yourself, I can't do it. I can't do it because that person will be mad. I can't do it because I'll lose this. I can't do it because I won't have a job. I can't do it because of this. You have to hear me on this. Because when the Lord gives you that calling and that instruction, it is never going to be at some convenient time. It's going to be at one of those inconvenient times. It's going to seem like God did not call you to do it. But see, you know, by way of the Holy Spirit, what was welling up in you. You even had confirmation of the tool set that would come with it. But then you said, I can't do it. Fear won out. Do you hear me? It was fear of those immediate consequences that stopped you. Let's continue. These guys, they obeyed the angel. They went forward and ministered. Now listen, this is very important that you hear this. And when they, this, let's go back, 27. And when they had bought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them saying, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us by the way. That same statement was said to you. Let me read that statement that was said to you again. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. You have filled their heads with your stuff. Uh-oh. Why would somebody be afraid of somebody else's speech? Why would somebody burst out? You see, you're going to have them thinking like you think. Did you happen to run into that one? They're going to they're gonna think just like you. Of course, they probably said they're going to be crazy just like you. Why the similarity is because it's the exact same spirit. Oh, and by the way, it's not coming from those who would consider themselves sinners. This is coming from those who would consider themselves Christians. Let's continue. So after they said, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, this is where you have to listen up and highlight this for yourselves. 49, Peter answers that challenge. And Peter says, with the other apostles, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be prince and savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. That was verse 30. 31 and 32 because that translates into what you ought to have in your spirit well it's already in your spirit it's just that fear takes it out you know when you start to speak you say what's the use i can't wreck everything here i can't damage everything here because that's indeed what pops into your mind if you speak you're going to damage everything if you speak you're going to have no security if you're speak it's almost like this darkness makes you think life is going to be over for you if you act in accordance with truth. If you go forward with what the Lord gave you, that darkness will make you feel that your life will be over, that you'll lose everything. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. But your answer, the answer is important here. 
What did they, what was their answer? They said, we ought obey God, God rather than men. That's where it begins in 29, 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. In our case, we could say what? That it was men, men who were against Christ, who hung him on a tree and slew him. 31 says, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be prince and savior. We can say the same thing. For to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, but in this case, we could say God has exalted Christ Jesus to be prince and savior, to give repentance to all and to forgive sins. Let me tell you what happens in view of darkness when you say this. Because what you're doing is speaking about the heart of the gospel. You're speaking about the heart of God's heart. When you start talking about the cross, don't you know what that is? When you start talking about the cross and you say God sent his son, who they hung on a tree and slew him, who men did this on a tree, those who stood against him, they killed him. Do you know that cuts a demon in 50 billion pieces? That statement right there with no rebuke, no anything, just to say that cuts them to the heart. Do you know that? It will slay everything in front of you because you may not know this. When Jesus went to the cross, look at what he undid by way of his pain and his torment on the cross. And do you know that the cross reminds every single demon of what they're about to enter into? They're skipping and hopping around right now bothering mankind. You know who Jesus is? He's the warden and the jailer. He's the one they will run away from. He is the one they cannot escape. And it's his word they cannot disobey. Remember when Legion was in that boy? What was the first thing that demon said? I'm going to paraphrase. They said, hey, we have nothing to do with you, Jesus. That's when they said, what have we to do with thee, thou son of man, son of God? Right? Have you come to torment us before the time? See, while they torment mankind, Jesus is their ever-present torment. He is, he's the one that will give you the order, and that will be it for them. So when you start speaking about the cross, to them it's undeniable. Demons absolutely believe. That's what you must never forget. They absolutely believe. They absolutely know. Do you understand? And they know their sentence. So when you start speaking about the cross, that's when you have God's armor on. When you remind men, now in this case, when they were speaking this way in view of men, what were they doing? What were they doing? Because we know that the Bible says a man cannot sin of himself. You have to agree with sin for it to be complete. And sin is often inspired by darkness, isn't it? So you have to come into full agreement with darkness in order to sin. You have to say yes. All of you know, you know, you may not have spoken, but you already know. It is very difficult to do something wrong. Because you sit there and have a conversation with yourself. You justify what you have to do wrong. You sit there and have more conversations until you convince yourself that that is the way it must be. Or you have to totally turn away from Jesus consciously, knowingly. So it's not like we accidentally sinned. We know what took place before the sin. Listen, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be prince and savior. Him, Jesus Christ, the name that they were preaching in, the name that these priests were afraid of, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be prince and savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is all the Holy Ghost. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. I love that statement. And so is the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. That's a big communication. Because if we're telling them how God is working in this earth by way of the Holy Ghost, that they're witnesses of Christ Jesus, you are too. If you believe in Jesus Christ and he died on the cross and was raised again, and if the story of the cross gets to you right there at the heart of your heart, you too are a witness. You're a witness. But how many people have you told that to? When your confronter, when that individual with darkness came up to you, do you know what normally happens? You speak nothing about your true belief in Jesus. You don't do it. Isn't that funny? You won't do it. It hasn't been done yet. Have you noticed that? It is sometimes we assume the other person knows and you go to something else. You start talking about scripture. Maybe you're talking about the necessity of certain things in scripture. But don't you find it odd that you didn't talk about your belief, your personal belief in Yahshua HaMashiach and him going to the cross and what they did. Haven't you found that odd and strange? Why won't that thought pop into your mind? Because in the environment of fear, fear desires to win, to overcome, to run your life. 
And when you're in fear, you end up defending yourselves. You know what they did? They stood up spiritually, denying their own flesh. They were in absolute obedience. And so they spoke in a spiritual way. They probably had fear too. We know they did reading in other chapters, but they chose Christ. Every time you have fear, choose Christ. Do you hear me? When you have fear, because men will have fear. No one need act like they don't fear. But every time fear comes to you, choose Christ. Learn this very well, 30, 31, and 32. And the next time you're opposed by such, tell the truth. See, the truth is, you know that Jesus went to the cross and was crucified and slayed by men for the sins of the world. The sins you committed, the sins I committed. You know that God has exalted his son with his right hand to be prince and savior for to give repentance to all who would believe, who would repent. Your affirmation of that is everything. But all too often we do not communicate that to our situation, whether it includes a person or not. You're still dealing with darkness. Let's continue. So that that was 30, 31, 32. And let them know that you are a witness of the goodness of the Lord, that you would not be where you are without Christ, that you would be the worst person on earth without the gospel of Jesus Christ. Communicate the truth about your Lord and Savior. Edify him. That makes a difference. To us, it's simple praise. But to darkness, it's a sword. It's an effective weapon. It's a reminder. It's a clock to let them know they don't have much time. You don't do it in anger. No, do it in truth. Acts 5.33, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So guess what it did? It didn't make the situation easier because they were cut to the heart. It infuriated those folks, the priest. It infuriated the priest. And you still have to listen up because you already know what happens when you say what you want to say back to the individual and they get twice as mad or in case of your circumstances when you try to press through and your circumstances double they double in negativity your situation gets worse you already know what that is but you cannot stop see once you begin stepping going forward in the lord don't look back because it is a sodom and gomorrah situation now all of us know the consequences of looking back when you look back you go back into that prison and the bars are twice as strong. All of us know this. All you have to do is don't look back, but look forward to Christ. Don't look forward to the sunset. Don't start dreaming up poetry or anything else. Don't sit there and tell yourself things are gonna be all right. Don't say any of those things. Keep focused on Christ. When you profess the cross to somebody, don't ever do that unless you truly mean that down at the depths of your heart. And when you do it, that is your statement about your relationship with Christ and what you truly believe, and you live by that. If you say it, you ought to be living by it. Don't ever say something you're not living by. Boldness is not because of how we speak. Boldness equates to persistence. That's a person who refuses to turn around and to look back. Somebody can push me backward all day. I'm still not going to look back. I'm going to look forward to Christ. When you face obstacles, often it's going to look like they're going to get the upper hand. Don't ever look back. If you don't look back, their power, it will diminish. You just keep looking forward. Demons are tricky. Darkness is tricky. They can make everything around you look like you lost. Don't believe that either. Don't ever believe you lost. That is contrary to the word of God. And you've got to make it up in your mind. Who are you going to believe? Never forget we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't walk. We don't take another step spiritually by what we see. We walk by faith. You don't see things of faith. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, you can't see it. But the substance you cannot deny. Because internally in your soul, there's confirmation of it. That's why conviction comes so heavily. When we don't do those things we ought to do. So you already know it's there. You can't explain that to somebody else. It's not for you to explain to everybody else. It's for you to live by Don't ever look back. It does not matter what you hear, what you see in the front to the sides. Never look back. Never looking back is don't consider going backward. That's what never looking back is. Don't ever consider to go back to the prison to make things easy. No, you know what that's doing? That's saying, Lord, I can't obey you right now. Lord, I can't do what you would like me to do because darkness is telling me not to. 
Don't live your life like that. You see, that's what's been happening to a lot of people up until this point. They have actually said, Lord, I cannot do what you have called me to do because darkness doesn't want me to do it. And that's what we say when we're not looking forward to Christ, when we give in to our situation, when we agree to stay in that prison. 34, listen, they were so angry at this, but 34 then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor in the law and reputation among the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. In other words, in other words, this guy, he said, hold on. Gamaliel said, hold on, don't do this. Don't do this. You need to give them some room here. So listen, here's what I'm telling you. Isn't it funny? Some of you, you have looked forward. Not very many, but some of you have looked forward. And guess what? Somebody came to your aid that you never expected. When you agree to look forward and to obey Christ, no matter what, I'm telling you, it never fails. The people you never expect come to your aid, to the individual who's trying to suppress you. Somebody is a witness of this because somebody stood up for them and said, wait a minute, they found substance in what you were saying and, and told the other person, back off a little. Some of you know exactly what that is. It may have been fleeting, but you know what that is. And all the rest of you who have not gotten to that part yet, pay attention to those who are among you who already understand this. They already know it. They may not have followed the other steps, but they know that as soon as they agree to go forward in obedience and they don't back down from darkness anymore, that somebody will stand up that they never expected to say, hold on. They'll tell that person filled full of darkness one of their own friends will turn to them and say, stop, hold on. Same thing happened here. Same thing happened here. He said, hold on, give some space to these apostles. It continues and said unto them, ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. See, when it's about to turn ugly, that's when they stand up. When somebody goes too far, that's when they stand up. But here's what you may not know. They only stand up. Because God is the one having them stand up based on your persistence and faith to go forward. Now remember, this is not by force. This is you not saying no to the Messiah because of darkness. That's all it is. That means you're making your relationship known in view of men. Isn't it, isn't it funny how you can make your relationship with Christ known to all the strangers in the world? But you cannot make your true relationship made known to the people right there where you are. Don't you find that odd? That when you try to, to tell somebody that's right there with you that, hey, this is my relationship with Christ, and they'll stop you. There's, I don't want to hear it. And they try to provoke you. They try to get you into anger to make you start defending your relationship with Christ. That's what you must know. You don't have to defend your relationship with Christ. It needs no defense. But that spirit that's near you, it operates this way. Let me continue. So he says, you better watch what you're doing concerning these men, what, you, uh, what you're about to do to these men. He said, for before the days rose up uh, uh, Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who were slain. And all as many as obeyed him were scattered and bought to nothing. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, drew away much people after him, and he also perished. And all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye, have, ye, ye be found to fight against God. So he warned him. See, God will always start speaking through somebody's right there in your prison. Somebody is right there with the one who put you in that prison, who has agreed to oppress you or to keep you there in that prison. God will raise up a stranger to speak to the one who persists to keep you behind bars. But hear me, this is only when you agree to continue to look to Christ. You cannot look to fear. Don't look to intellect in your mind. Don't try to dance your way out of it. You don't have to compromise anymore. No more compromise. You know what compromise is? That's when internally in your mind, something speaks to you, something that is not of your father. And it says this, well, just go ahead and make peace and try it again another day. Just relent, make peace, 
change how you're speaking change this whole direction go ahead and surrender to the oppressor so you can have peace don't talk about christ for one don't talk about those scriptures for one just bow out so you can have peace and sure enough later on when you have that peace you sit there and smile like some big thing was done no all they did was cause you to agree to stay in that prison even longer take note of this in 39 a truth was told that always confuses people in 39 acts 5 39 it says but if it be of god if what be of god the works that these apostles are doing if it be of god he says you cannot overthrow it unless you find yourself fighting against god if something is of god you cannot overthrow it it won't be overthrown no external force can overthrow it but satan can often certainly in these times convince the individual who desires to walk forward to stop walking forward in today's cases that is what's happened a threat was placed before your face that threatens to damage who you are to the world who you are to those you love come on now somebody you know that's the threat they have threatened to cut you off from everybody you love and to have everybody you love look at you sideways that's the threat and so in your mind something speaks and says are you willing to lose all of them just for this just make peace and keep all of that and then you live your life you have certain family members you have certain friends but you cannot speak freely with what the lord god has placed within you and you know for a fact you have not let it out what you may not know somebody desperately needs what god has put in you they need that in the world every day we see a degradation of the world in some way form or fashion the word god putting you not the word you thought of not the word somebody else gave you but the word god putting you others need that word globally that word is being stifled somehow you already know that but this is why we have this this is the day the lord has made you know what that means this day can make a difference this day can be a brand new beginning this day can be the start of your process that no bars will ever hold you again this could be the day that the foundations of all prisons break this could be that day if you want to declare something then declare this day lord i'll pay more attention to you and follow you this day i'll cease those compromises if you strengthen me to cease those compromises this day be honest and say lord i am afraid don't tell everybody you have no fear but at home you're afraid no tell the lord the truth lord i have much fear and i need you or i'm stuck that's what you say be open to the messiah he already knows your condition but have you confessed your condition to him have you told him the truth or are we posturing because i'll tell you something i know what posturing is and posturing can cause those bars to increase in size no no with one word god can break the entire prison but that begins with you that's the joy of the messiah by way of the blood of the lamb this day is brand new it carries nothing old i'll be right back in a few minutes we're going to continue this how your situation developed it didn't happen all at one time it happened over a duration of time so listen don't ever think that somehow you've got to turn everything around right now tonight no nope. steady steps steady steps that's how you do it steady steps step by step by step by step they were not delivered out of israel in one step the messiah did not die and was raised again in one step no those were steps step by step so i'm telling you now this is a brand new day and you're not by yourself see some of you think you're by yourself and you say well I, how can i do this that's your, that's one of the major problems don't ever devise how to do it the goodness of the lord is this he can lead you step by step in how to do it you don't have to know the next step with the messiah most people get themselves in these positions because they control the steps i'll be the first to tell you i don't control my steps i don't have to i don't have to worry about that i don't have to worry about where the messiah is going for me in my life it's almost like this i i wake up and the lord says let's go i say well let's go i don't even ask where to i just go stress-free i desire the lord's way to be established and you have to ask yourself something 
What way do you desire to be established? Your way or the Lord's way? Because I'll tell you right now, I already know the consequences of my way. It can look good for a little while, but there's no way I can micromanage everything that needs to be micromanaged or manage anything down the road. So I let go. I simplify, but I do not compromise. Well, sometimes not compromising which is not turning your back on Christ, not telling fear, I'm going to listen to you and disregard the words of the Messiah. No, I don't do the compromising because compromising is looking back. Compromising is going backward. Compromise does not bring peace. It allows darkness to win. Many of you thought you were bringing peace into the home. You were not. All you were doing was shutting yourself down spiritually. You're not spiritually dead either. You're not too far gone either. And that doesn't happen with the Most High because you still believe. And because you still believe today can always be that first day. Never be in a rush, but be ready to initiate that first step of faith. Not because you know it, but of faith. Know what you're committing to, which is the Messiah. You already love his work and his gospel. Yes, voices have come to try and get you not to love his gospel. Can't you see that everything has come to get you off and away from the gospel? But when you were young, why did you look around? Why were you so hopeful for everybody? Who told you to change that? Why did you believe that miracles were possible? Who told you they were not? Who stifled your faith over time? Was it not flesh, your education, your ambition in the world? That's the key word, the world. To have the world. Now you know what the world demands, that you abandon Christ and the gospel. Your situation is telling you what darkness demands for you to abandon Christ. And the world will always present you. The world is darkness. It'll present you that perfect thing. And it will dangle it in front of your face and say, if you want this, you can no longer speak like that. That's what it's been doing. But see, there's a complication that comes with all of you. You did want that beautiful picture. You did. Many of us did. We wanted that beautiful picture. But something in us put a halt to it. And it keeps putting a halt to it. It's almost like we can't commit all the way. We cannot commit all the way to the world. Something keeps pulling us back, doesn't it? That's your father. That's the power of the Lord. He's not willing to lose you. And if he's not willing to lose you, listen up. That means you truly belong to the Most High. Because if you did not belong to the Most High, you would have already been lost in the world. And you would not believe in Christ at all. That's how you know if you have a reprobate mind, because you would have no belief in Christ Jesus or the cross. You would think he was just another historical figure, but you do believe, and you don't have that belief because you're such a good person. No, you have that belief because you're family with the Most High, and that mechanism that kicks in that won't allow you to go all the way in the world, that's the promised spirit with you, with you right now. That's how Christ said he would never leave nor forsake you. That in his name, you would ask of the Father and the Holy Spirit will be sent to you. That spirit is with you right now because you're family. You're not an outcast. You're not a disappointment. You're family. God already knew your trials and everything else. You're family. And this prison that you're in, it was going to break. But God determines when it breaks. Your environment of your soul should never be a place of bondage. And it does not have to be a place of bondage. And everything can change when you yourselves commit. Remember, it didn't happen all at one time. It didn't happen all at one time for the apostles. Yes, they were led out of prison to be brought forth before council. And as soon as you break out, everybody's going to be as mad as hornets. But what I'm telling you is if you keep your eyes on the Messiah, that's the obstacle, right? The part you don't want to face the confrontation is scaring you away. You don't want the confrontation. The confrontation lets you know that you just broke free. Don't you know that? So you keep your eyes on the Messiah. Don't think up crafty words in your head to say, but tell the truth. You cannot help but to be exactly who you are because you believe in the Messiah. You know what he did at the cross. You can't explain it, but you know it. You can't prove it, but you absolutely believe it. And you did from birth. You have to exp listen, tell somebody that. You didn't do that before. Isn't it funny how we don't do that? We do that to the strangers and the friends and the people that we don't know. But when it comes to the one that's keeping you locked up in a prison, 
Have you ever said, listen, I'm sorry, I can't help but to be who I am. Jesus died on the cross and I absolutely believe. I can't go for this other stuff. I have a belief in me that's beyond my own explanation. No one can take it away from me and I choose to honor him. And my belief in him will never go away. When you explain that relationship, you know what you do? You know what you do? That, that vessel, that person of whom darkness is using, you just stuck an obstacle in that person, in that situation, in that circumstance. You just introduced a truth. See, God works by truth. He doesn't work by lies. He doesn't work by craftiness. I have experience in that one. I know for a fact he is not going to, it doesn't matter how smart of a plan you have. If it's not truth, God will have nothing to do with it. God works in truth. But don't you find it odd how difficult it is to tell those closest to you the truth about your relationship with Christ? Don't you find it odd? One of the mistakes is we try to present it in a way that's above the level of the one we're speaking to. Mistake number one, that's not spoken in a genuineness. That's a crafted message. You don't have to craft it. Let it be true through and through. That's when you'll see the work of the Messiah's hand. That's when you'll see the impossible take place. That's when you see it. That's when you become a witness of it. And I'll tell you something. If that prison that you're in, once it's broken, once you are vindicated and released, don't you know what happens? You become an experiencer. You know what happens when you have experience with that? A threat can come to you every single day. You know what you'll say? The Lord is my victory. He is my freedom. You know in the Old Testament and the songs that they use where they say Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, and they say all these different names, those are titles that people know the Lord by. Do you not know that the Lord desires us to know those titles? Listen, not to know them to pronounce them, but to know them for our lives. He wants you to know he is a healer, not because he said so, not because you read it, not because you saw it in somebody else, but because he healed you. He wants you to know he's your banner, not because you saw it in a book and it sounds good. No, for you to be a direct witness of it. You to witness all these things within yourselves. Why do you think you have so many circumstances that you need most of God's names to intervene? If he becomes your healer, you needed that. If he come, becomes your provider, you needed that. Don't you see that? In times of old, they knew him by his names because he performed those things in their personal lives. You're no different. And the more names you know him by, the more established you are in this earth spiritually. You've been set up to know him by those names. Look at your life. Look at your circumstances. Look at your trials and your tribulations. Those are not happenstance, because each one, had you gone through them, had you gone through them by way of faith, not look for a way of escape, because God promised a way of escape out of a sinful situation. Your trials and tribulations are divine. You go through them by way of the word, not by way of flesh, not to sneak out of them, not to solve them. We're not to solve them. We are to be delivered from them. We are to be healed in them. We are to be quickened in them. That's what they're for. That's why they come and go as though they were never there in the first place. Haven't you found that odd? Of all those things you went through, you can remember them, but something is missing from each one. And sometimes, most times, you're delivered from them and you don't even know how you're delivered. We're not here just to pass away this time. This is your one-shot deal. Your chance to say, Lord, there is, there is no darkness that can make me say no. You're doing that now. In this prison, this is a big one. Because for the most part, this prison makes people say no all the time. If you can recognize that, there's only one reason you could ever recognize that. There's only one reason you could agree with some of the things I'm saying tonight about that prison. You know what it is? It's that you are to be freed from it. You are to go to the next step. And the Lord's going to lead you into doing that. Not me. The Lord. That's why you have comprehension of your own circumstances in this way. That's why you see it in this way. Every single time in the Word of God, when somebody was in bondage, God had them understand that what type bondage they were in right before he broke that bondage. You're no different. While the world spirals out of control in its circumstances, having to deal with war, with weather, with things in the skies, 
You're going through your time too. They're entering into a time of torment. You're entering into your time of victory. That's opposite of what the world goes through. I'll tell you right now, the world's going downhill. You will not go downhill with it. The Lord was very clear about that. Not some magical escape from any war that would break out right now. Nope, that's not how that works. He will bring you right through it. See, a lot of people, they just want to get out of everything. And that's the problem. Once you have experience, the very first thing you never tried to do is escape anything because you know you will be delivered. Experience is confidence. Confidence means you're unmovable. If somebody has no confidence and trouble comes, they'll say, oh, I have to do something. I don't know if God will deliver me. But somebody who has confidence by way of their experience, it'll come and they'll stand right in the middle of it and declare the victory of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord. They won't declare that they're going to escape, that the storm will hop over them. They'll say, Lord, thank you for every moment. They give true things. See, nobody here has gone anywhere. You're still here, and the world has fallen apart in several different places. You didn't go anywhere. Your circumstances, you still had to stay in there. You weren't freed from those circumstances. The Lord maneuvers you because you're in those circumstances. Don't ever think that somehow God is not involved in your personal lives. So long as you believe in the Messiah, then your life is carefully molded, carefully put together for a reason, for a big reason. My way of the blood every day is a new day. And it's time for many of you to start your standing. You haven't lost time. You know, in the Bible, it says God will redeem the time. You know what that means? Don't make it to what you want it to be. See it for what it is. That means all the time that we wasted in foolishness will not be lost time. That means that what, what everybody called foolishness and even what you called foolishness, God can turn that into experience. My goodness, all of that foolishness can be turned to experience. Youth will not bring you experience. To make you youthful again is not going to give you experience. But by the Holy Spirit to recall things that have happened in your life, to have you find Christ and your Father in them, to allow you to see again the deliverance of those issues, that's experience. Those ten virgins, five foolish, five wise, five had oil, five did not. The five that didn't have any oil said, "Let give us some of your oil. They said, we can't. you got to go back and buy it. Why would they ever say that? Because your experience is that oil. Experience is what keeps that flame lit. That's experience. You cannot give anybody your experience. They have to go back and earn it. And it comes with a price. And some of you have paid a high price. You think you paid that price for nothing. Wrong. You've got oil. Circumstances will warrant what you've gone through. One day, you'll say, thank you, Lord, for every measure of discomfort I ever went through. And those who have no experience, they're going to say, well, I just don't know. I just can't believe. I just can't have, I don't have the strength. It's I, my belief won't stay while well, you have no oil. You got to go back and buy your own. You have to pay a price for this. I can't give you mine. It's not transferable. Don't ever think you're stuck because you're not. But I tell you, there's some decisions you now have to make. Nothing need happen overnight. God does things steady. Have you noticed? If he did things overnight, we would pop out of the womb groan and be delivered into heaven the next day. He didn't do things overnight. God has a process to everything he does. A very thorough process according to his will, according to what he has decreed. And your life is in that will. You're going to have these elements in your life. All of us have, but they come at different times. And those who suffer it early will not suffer it at the end. And those who suffered at the end did not go through it early. And how many of you have suffered it early? See, Jesus made a universal promise. He made a universal promise. It's just like your life. Many of you were born into this world suffering. And many of you that were born into this world suffering, you think you're going to suffer at the end. God doesn't work that way. He has a standard and a process for all. And if you don't go through it early, you're going through it late. If a person has skipped every single piece of suffering they could ever skip, they're going to go through all of it in a very compact time at the end. Either way, if he loves them, they must endure that process. No one will escape the process. That's why not one person should be scared of that word tribulation. They say the great tribulation, everybody says, oh, no, not me. I'm not going to go through that because uh, I'm going I'm to be out of here. 
And the same people have been saying that for a very long time, but here's what they're not getting. People were born into great tribulation. It's just been spread out over the course of time. Can't you see that? How many of you have begged that your life change? You begged that your life would change, and it didn't. You kept going through things, didn't you? You think that was a mistake? No, what the Lord did was he had great grace and mercy upon you. So he took your great tribulation and he stretched it. And year by year, you've been living it. But you've certainly been going through the process because it produces something. In the Bible, it says he learned obedience through sufferings. We do the same thing. Some people have escaped those sufferings. They've been limited up in the world. And the Bible has a promise for them that they will not live it up in the end days when things start. See, a lot of people think, even right now, they think that men are in absolute control. No, they're not. Men are sitting in more and more confusion. Governments are in confusion. Something else is, has taken the reins of them. They have to go through a process also, and it will match what's in the Word of God. No one will escape the process. See, that's important for you to see. That's important for all of us to see. I know my life. I was born into this world, and I've gone through some sufferings. I'm not afraid of suffering because I'm not living here for me. Only when you're living life for yourself do you seek to save yourself. And that's why those who seek to save themselves, they're going to end up losing their souls. Those who seek to save their lives are going to lose it. Why? Because they seek to save themselves because they're living for themselves. Those who live for Christ, they already understand because you're living for Christ. You're not concerned about your own life. It's not your life anymore. By love, you live your life. Not love like in the movies. The power of love who is God the Father. When you live your life for that type royalty, for the Creator, you don't seek to save your life. You seek to accomplish the will of God at any cost. And everything is worth it. Everything is. Your life becomes totally different. And by the way, that's impossible without the Holy Spirit. You can't even complete what you need to complete without the Holy Spirit. So that means some of you, you might want to get ready for a change because you know and I know that you've been called to a serious level with the Lord. It's unlike any other place you've been at, you've been called to. You know that you cannot get off the level, the step you're at without great sobriety. Some of you have this understand. Well, many of you have this understanding in you. You just didn't know that your brothers and sisters had the same understanding in them. Your situation is about to break, but it's not going to break so that you can go into the world and in sin. That sobriety must come first. Those prison bars are going to break upon your agreement with obedience. And that's not something you speak because the Lord intends to stand you on your feet. See, because once you agree, it is the angels that will uphold you in the ways of the Lord. That's when they work and are dispatched to you. They will not hold you up so that you can do it your way. They work for you as you follow Christ. Remember that. These are the end days. These are the last times. And I mean the last times. And people do not have what they thought they had last year. They don't have the time they thought they had. It will come as a surprise. I say to 99% of the world, the world right now does not expect any major calamities to happen within the next 10 days, do they? They have no expectation of that. Does anybody have an expectation of a complete life change in a very short time like that? I mean, when I say complete, I mean complete. A complete life change. Like a, like a light switch went off and everything was different. And nobody was thinking about their homes and their cars and their money. People aren't going to think about that stuff. I can tell you that right now. The change will be so drastic that will not be a thought in people's minds. It's likened to a person having a, a, a bad problem. They're depressed and down and out and everything else. And then all of a sudden they get a phone call and something unbearable took place. They forget about their own oppression. They forget about everything wrong in the house because when a heavier problem comes, the problems you had prior to that are gone. That's precisely what's going to take place. Man doesn't control that timing. And no one will see it coming. I'm telling you now, no one is going to see it. I'm not going to see it coming. All I know is the season. I can't be exact on that. You're already in the season. The upsets are coming. The Lord wasn't playing when he said, he basically said, if you're going to make it, you're going to make it by him or you're not going to make it at all. God wasn't playing. 
when he led those out of Egypt, and when he gave that way to Moses, what happened to those who were working against Moses? They died in the wilderness. You're already in the wilderness. You don't even know it, but you're in the wilderness. You're already at that 40-year mark. Deliverance is coming. People are not aware of the closeness of a few things, and they cannot be uttered. But I'm telling you now, you're in that season. This requires a time of sobriety, and most of all, a time of truth. Truth from within you to your Messiah, hiding nothing. This is a very good time to expose all things to him, not to your neighbor, to him. That relationship with the Messiah is key to everything. But I'll ask you something. For those of you who are in these prisons, with all honesty, have you really invited the Lord in to see everything? Have you spoken to him about the truth of everything? See, because often we think we have. But when's the last time you told the Lord that you're frightened to fear? When's the last time you told the Lord you don't pray very well? That's a truth, isn't it? Is that not a truth? That's a truth. That's the type of truth I'm talking, not the rehearsed stuff that we have. So you got to be careful because sometimes men will give you these rehearsed lines. And then if you adopt those rehearsed lines, you believe them yourselves and you will not grow. We're not talking about adopting anybody's lines. The Lord knows the truth. So if he already knows the truth, but you're not speaking in alignment with that truth, what does he see? This may sting, but he sees hypocrisy. If he can see the truth of us, and he does, and we're speaking something else, he sees hypocrisy. He does not see truth. But when we speak truth to him, the absolute truth, not this made up stuff, the truth to him, he operates in truth. That's a first step to speak in truth, because he already knows. He knows people have a problem with their tongues. He knows they have a problem with their thoughts. He knows that they slip back and forward between flesh and spirit. He knows the habits we try to hide even from ourselves. He already knows this. This is a time for truth, nothing rehearsed. Truth, and I'll tell you right now to make the biggest difference in your life. When before him you open wide open. When you speak in alignment with the truth God sees of you. Speaking without hypocrisy. I used to speak with lots of hypocrisy. Speaking with strength when I had none. With confidence when there was none. As though I was unmovable when I was afraid. That yields nothing but the same. And if you want to stay in the same position you've been in for years, then keep doing it the flesh way. You want the Holy Spirit to intercede? Open up to Him. That spiritual environment of imprisonment, you want that broken? Open up to Him. Open up to Him and speak truth to Him. Go in your secret place. That could be the bathroom. That could be the closet. That could be anywhere. So long as it's a place that you commune with the Lord. And if you don't have a place, seek to find one. But open up to him. Step away from all hypocrisy. Hypocrisy can keep you in prison for years. Don't agree to stay imprisoned. Have those chains broken. There's a host of angels that stand by, awaiting to be employed by those who would walk in the way of the Lord. Not some programmed way, not some traditional way, but by way of truth, of absolute truth. What we deny, that's the very area that's not touched. Truth brings healing. Truth invites the power of the Holy Spirit. And we read tonight that the Holy Spirit is reserved for those who obey the Lord. One of the first steps in obedience is to never to speak in hypocrisy. Hypocrites go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. For us, it keeps us damaged. You do not have to spend another day like that. Initiate the process. It's the Lord you believe in anyway. And he already knows our true condition. We just sometimes convince ourselves we don't have that condition. Don't we do that? The penalties are real. Sufferings are real. We already know sufferings are real. We already know the decay of the body, the bones hurting. We already know those things. And how much more will they be multiplied in the days to come? You're in a time where people will not be fortunate and they will not escape. It's going to get to a point where people think that somehow, may possibly, God has abandoned everybody. He did not. He's already told us of this time. we got to be careful not to make it into what we want, but to follow Christ and seek to know from Him what it actually is. Because whether we get it right or not, it's still coming. And it will come His way, not our way. And it will upset the masses. And it won't align with half of what's been said. And it will correct us. But we can prepare now. We have knowledge of such things. 
I spoke to a person one time, and this person said, I already know what I need. And this person was implying they know what they need from the Lord. I already know what I need. That's what they said. Five years later, the person said the same thing. 30 years later, the person said the same thing. They're in the same condition now that they were back then. And their situation is almost totally degraded. Why? Because they want God to answer in the way they feel he should answer. That's why. Because they, by way of tradition, keep saying the same things. And they refuse to speak truth. They are broken and battered. And they deny it. But they are broken. Their health continues to decline. Why? Because they keep pushing everything away. And they keep doing it man's way. They can't even see. There's no confession of truth when we deny what is. See, the Lord is that one individual you can always tell what is. To another person, they'll say, how do you feel? Well, I hope I'm going to get better. You can say that to a person. With the Lord, you can be honest. Lord, I'm broken down. This stuff hurts and it's uncomfortable. That's truth. This isn't a movie where you tell your master, oh, it's, it's, it's good and it's getting better. That's, that's not true. That's almost like you're trying to have faith in your statements to Christ who can grant your request of faith. But we've overstepped our bounds by claiming something he hasn't granted yet, which is almost like a demand from us. People are demanding in this day and age. Haven't you noticed? They demand what they want. Well, let me clue everybody in on something. We can always find out when something is broken, but God knows how to fix it, not us. And what do we do in our prayers? Lord, grant me such and such to fix the problem. Isn't that how we do? Lord, give me $900 to fix the problem. Lord, give me, let this person do this to fix it. We always have demands of the Messiah. That's not asking him anything. What we're asking him to do is to fulfill our will. Can you see that? When we predefine what the Messiah is going to do, that's overstepping our bounds. There's no grace in that. That's trying to make God comply with what our will is. And people do, they, they don't like that term, God's will be done. And that's foolishness. And it's the best statement anybody could ever say. Because what they've had up to this moment was their own will. And their lives are torn up. But if we can recognize these things, why would we continue to do them? Part of the condition of those who would imprison, those who actually believe, is to cause them to do such things, to adopt ways that they shouldn't adopt. Folks, we're talking about a, a, a 180 degree turn to turn away from oppression and darkness and compromise of faith and to put everything back into the hands of the Savior and King. He is Savior and King. He lives. He's not dead. To remind ourselves of who we are in relation to the Messiah. Be truthful in that fashion so that he can raise you up. Because when he raises you, that's when you speak his word. And God watches over his word to perform it. And he will never fail to do that. But if I stand before him in a hypocritical condition, if I, by way of hypocrisy, had a prayer, and I denied something that was true, and then I evoke his word, if the foundation is based in a lie, then the rest of the word has nothing to do with him. I can quote it all day. That's not going to help you. Satan can quote the word of God. Is God supposed to evoke the completion of his word based on what Satan says? No. Satan can quote scripture. Demons can quote scripture. He's not going to perform what a demon is saying. Why would he perform anything I'm saying if the basis of all of what I say is rooted in hypocrisy? That is not his word. His word is rooted in truth, not hypocrisy. You see the difference? That's why Satan can quote scripture. Nothing happens. But Paul can quote scripture and a miracle takes place. That's the difference. It's the root that matters. Do you all see that? Time to break the prison doors, isn't it? Don't agree to stay in that prison. Don't agree to stay oppressed or in darkness. Don't do it. Take that step and stand in truth. No more hypocrisy. No more. We're talking about with the Messiah. You don't do that with me. I'm not an intrusive person. I don't need to know the details of your life. The Lord knows the details of your life. So when you converse with the Lord and by heart, do it in truth, not by a lie. Never try to be slick to try and get something out of Christ. He already knows what we're up to. Don't agree to do those things, nor to be in that prison. But agree to step out of darkness into truth. If you ever step out of darkness, the only foundation you can step on is truth. Everything else is darkness. The truth belongs to the Most High. 
folks, you see that? You see the weapons against you? The next step is up to you.